Thousands of people are fleeing southern Ukraine after the destruction of a major dam in an area controlled by Russia. The United Nations aid chief says the breach of the Kakhovka Dam could be the most significant damage to civilian infrastructure since the start of the war. Thousands have already been evacuated from flooded areas. There are also concerns over the nearby Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, which draws its cooling water from the reservoir that is now draining away. Kyiv says Moscow blew up the dam on the front line to slow Ukraine's military, while Russia is accusing Ukraine of sabotage. Meanwhile, the U.S. claims it cannot say conclusively what happened. With floodwaters rising, people grabbed what they could and fled. Everything is submerged in water. All the furniture, the fridge, food, all the flowers. Everything is floating. I don't know what to do. Satellite images taken two days apart show the extent of the damage to the Kakovka Dam. Officials say up to 80 towns and villages are at risk of flooding. Thousands of residents have been told to evacuate. The dam lies in Russian-controlled southern Ukraine and near the front line. Ukraine blames Moscow for the breach. President Volodymyr Zelensky claims that Kyiv knew that Russia had placed explosives on the dam last year. The information indeed came from our intelligence. We shared it with our partners and everyone essentially understood that the Russian Federation, together with certain collaborators, had mined the dam. But at a UN Security Council meeting to discuss the disaster, Russia again pointed the finger of blame at Ukraine. Why would we do it? Uh, and besides, the Ukrainians were threatening to ruin the dam a long time, including a fish. The United States representative countered this. I want to make absolutely clear. It was Russia that started this war. It was Russia that occupied this area of Ukraine. And it was Russian forces that took over the dam illegally last year and have been occupying ever since. World leaders have condemned what is being called a humanitarian and ecological disaster. Ukraine's environment minister has told DW that the breach of the dam will leave parts of his country's nature and wildlife in a state from which it can never recover. Ruslan Srilets also said up to one million people may be left without access to fresh water. He was speaking to DW correspondent Jack Parrick in Brussels. Uh, in my opinion, today we have the hugest uh, crimes, environmental crimes, uh, from the first day of full-scale invasion. I understand that uh, now we have destroyed a lot of territories, we have uh, uh, lost uh, national park territory, this is Nizhny Dniprovsky reservoir. Uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, destroyed um, parts of Emerald Network, European Emerald Network in our territory. And I understand that um, some parts of wild nature we lost forever. This is a barbarian act. Uh, this is a real ecocide. And uh, this is a real um, humanitarian catastrophe for future. Um, I understand that um, maybe one million people will be without uh, fresh water. Uh, from the first day of the full-scale invasion, we tried to calculate all environmental damage. Now we have more than uh, 2,400 cases of uh, environmental crimes. The total damage is more than 52 billion euros. I believe that in future it will be the base to get the reparations from Russia. Uh, now I mean, uh, not ab I, I say not about um, all reparation, I mean environment. Let's cross over to our correspondent Max Sander who is standing by in Kyiv there. Max, what's the latest? Very good morning, Gerhard. So what we're hearing from southern Ukraine, from the region of Kherson, is that the water levels there are still rising at this moment, though with uh, less intensity um, 
as before, but we expect the water levels to peak at some point during the day. Um, now, as far as now in the Kherson region, 2,000 houses are reported to have been destroyed and somewhat 1,500 people have been evacuated so far in that particular region, though authorities warn that up to 40,000 people uh, may be in danger of being flooded. Um, over the night, uh, people had been evacuated from the city of Kherson as well. We saw people there uh, holding out on the roofs of cars, on uh, roofs of, of houses, waiting for rescue teams to pick them up. Um, rescue teams from neighboring regions, from that region and from other places in Ukraine, uh, have arrived yesterday during the day and are trying to get people to safety there. Um, as far as now, the evacuations seem to be quite difficult um, due to limited access, due to flooded roads, limited communication, and there's also still shelling happening um, while uh, rescuers are trying to get people to safety there. In addition to that, there's another threat now um, with uh, landmines um, be having been washed away from the banks of the Dnipro River, now also uh, hampering rescue efforts there at the moment. There has been, there is an evacuation plan, plan in place, we hear, um, but uh, lots of people already had left due to, the, due to the fighting, had left these areas already, and those who are there at the moment, a lot of them um, are, seem to be the uh, people who are trying to hold out, um, not just the fighting, but also this new situation right now. Now, we just heard the uh, Ukrainian environment minister there uh, calling this an ecocide. Can you give us an idea of the scale of the damage? Right, so what we heard yesterday already is that roughly 150 tons of oil had been released in the Dnieper River. Um, this has an effect on the water quality overall, so this is going to be needed for drinking water, not just in Ukrainian-controlled territory, but also in Russian-controlled territory, as well as Crimea. The, the, the water is needed for um, agriculture as well. Um, so the Agricultural Ministry also said that 10,000 hectares of uh, agricultural land could be flooded. This could be, have a massive effect on food security as well. So this is something that, is, uh, th that will definitely ha need to be watched. In addition to that, um, authorities are warning of a nuclear disaster potentially looking upstream with uh, dropping levels in the, in the, uh, in the uh, water, water bodies there and the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant needing, uh, needing this water for cooling. The situation seems stable there at the moment, but this is definitely something that needs to be watched. The W correspondent Max Sander there in Kiev for us. Thank you, Max. Let's go to Mike Martin, now a senior war studies fellow at King's College in London, who joins us from there. Mike, 24 hours have passed since that breach. Have you seen anything in that uh, time that's made, uh, made up your mind about who did this? Uh, I'm 90% sure uh, that this is the Russians. Um, there is a slim chance that it happened by accident because the street structure had been weakened by previous military activity. But if you look at the timing where Ukraine is moving to a new phase of its counteroffensive, uh, and also uh, the fact that a lot of this water is going to have a huge humanitarian impact, um, is also taking out some Ukrainian positions on islands in the middle of the river. I think that's what the Russians were intending. But I think it's also important to note that I don't think that the Russians expected it to be this big and this serious. I think they wanted a small flood that would take out those Ukrainian positions, but it's ended up being something much bigger. Mm. Now, uh, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky said in his nightly address that this will not stop Ukraine from taking back occupied territory. How is this likely to change, quite literally, the shape of the battlefield? So I, I think Ukraine has uh, two jobs now. Obviously, it needs to focus on getting its civilians safe. And, and that really is the focus right now, as we've heard from your correspondents. But uh, that really, a week or so, that will be done. Um, and then the battlefield has changed. So downstream of the dam, um, it's going to be the river's going to be much wider, so it's going to be much more difficult for Ukraine to attack across the river. But upstream, eventually, as the waters recede, the river, particularly in the area of the current reservoir, or the, up until yesterday, where was the reservoir, will be smaller. So perhaps over the summer, that might dry out. I think looking at all these changes, and it's impossible to say exactly what the changes are going to be to the battlefield, we can talk in general terms. We should probably also note that the Ukrainian military is much more able to adapt than the Russian military. And so something of this scale, as you say, changing the shape of the battlefield, perhaps Ukraine might have an advantage in the speed at which it can adapt.
Now, this disaster, as you said, has struck uh, a territory that is mainly controlled uh, by the Russians. How will this affect their ability to defend against the Ukrainian offensive? Well, this is one of the main reasons why I think that they were uh, intending for a small break in the dam and they've ended up with a massive one. There are lots of reports of Russian soldiers on the south bank of uh, the river Dnipro climbing to the tops of trees and, and their positions have been wiped out. Um, so any possible gain that they might have had, perhaps they could redeploy those troops to another area to defend against a Ukrainian offensive, say, in the south towards Zaporizhia, have been wiped out. They are now having to look at rescuing their own troops. So uh, what I think, this has been a bit of a disaster that nobody wanted, and now both sides are having to adapt and respond. Uh, the Ukrainians are having to get their civilians out of the firing line. The Russians are having to redeploy their troops, and that obviously soaks up lots of logistics. So it, it actually, I suspect, in the long term is not going to have a huge effect on the battlefield. Mike Martin there. Thank you very much, Mike. Thank you.